Thank you very much for those kind words of introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me to come this evening to join you in this summer uh, discussion. An opportunity for us to contemplate the Dhamma, an opportunity for me to share some of my ideas on the Dhamma, and hopefully an opportunity for all of us to develop a better understanding. But as I am new to KL, and it's my first time to this center, and my first time with you, or although I have seen quite a few around during the last four or five days, it is quite hard for me to know what aspect of Dhamma would be of interest and of relevance to you. Because the Buddha's teaching is something very wide and very comprehensive. It relates to every aspect of life and it can be approached from so many different angles depending on the person's need, depending on the person's temperament, depending on one's conditioning, one's abilities. So different people will approach the Dhamma in different ways. We can see even here in KL many different Buddhist centers, many different Buddhist groups, and they all have slightly different approaches. There are the very ceremonial, religious, uh, ritual type of center. We also have various study centers. We have some meditation groups. We have some purely intellectual discussion groups. And on and on it goes. A great variety. And I think that's wonderful. Because the human nature is of many different types, many different character types, and each one needs a slightly different approach. But in the end, it is important to be able to bring the approach to the center. And the center of the Buddha Dhamma is the human heart and the human mind. If we really want to understand the Dhamma, if we really want to understand what the Buddha taught, we must understand our own minds. We must understand our own hearts. And we must be able to bring peace into our heart. The world of duality is infinite in variety. Just the variable nature of conditioned existence is endless. Especially in the realm of thoughts, views, opinions, ideas, beliefs, likes and loves, there is an endless variety. You will never come to an end. So that unless we understand how to get beyond all of this, we will never come to true peace. So this evening I probably will spend some time then talking about the center, coming to the center, the place of peace. Because in this world there seems to be so much conflict, so much tension, so much struggling and even fighting. And we don't have to look at the war in the Middle East to see this. Look in your own lives, in your own homes, and you will see it. Look in your own hearts, the struggle that goes on day by day with conflicting desires, conflicting aspirations, conflicting intentions, and you will see it. Conflict, dis-ease, the continuous struggle. So how can all of this be resolved and the human mind come to peace? Where is there a place to stand, a place of non-duality, a place of non-conflict, a place of non-multiplicity? 
just a place of rest and a place of peace. There is such a place. It is in our own hearts. It is the essence of our own hearts. It is the essence of our own minds. But unfortunately most of us don't know how to reach it. And we spend most of our time looking out there, seeking out there, seeking amongst all the creations of the world and all the creations of our own minds. But unfortunately, all of creation is always in the realm of duality, always in the realm of multiplicity. There's always two, if not more. That is the realm of creation. And where there is duality, there will always be conflict. As soon as I say, I think and I believe, there will always be someone else to say, I don't think so, and I don't believe that at all. As soon as I say, I like this, surely there will be another who says, I don't like it. And this is the realm of creation, the realm of duality. And as long as we seek for stability, seek for peace, in this realm, we will always be defeated. Because in this realm, there can never be complete agreement. In this realm, there can never be a complete end. So we need to be able to transcend and see beyond and experience beyond this realm. We need to go to the center where there is stillness and silence. Because it is in that stillness and silence that we begin to appreciate what peace is. The place of no conflict the place of non-duality. As long as we only live in the realm of creation and we only know the duality, we will never see a way beyond. We will never know a way beyond. As long as we believe and we hold to and attach to all that is creation, then we will always be in conflict. So I'd like to talk about this mind of ours then. First we can begin by just contemplating the nature of the external world, what we see around us. As I said, multiplicity. Multiplicity, variety. And you can see the problem that it creates in society. In a society such as we have here in Malaysia, which is a multicultural society, a society of many cultures, many races, many languages, many religions. And then even within one religion, there's always such a variety. And even within one race, there is such a variety of people. And we can see the potential for a lot of suffering, the potential for a lot of strife, for a lot, for a lot of conflict. We have seen it through history and we can still see the potential right here. When we attach, when we grasp at one race, when we grasp at one language, when we grasp at one religion, when we grasp at one belief, one view, one political system, what is the consequence? It sets us against another. And when the grasping becomes rigid and we become fanatical, the result is not just disagreement. It can be quite disastrous forms of conflict. We have seen this through history and we can still see the potential for this right here today in this country. This is a danger of not knowing the way to peace. Not knowing the nature of conditioned existence, not knowing the nature of beliefs, the nature of views and opinions, not knowing the nature of this realm of mortality. Then if we look a little more closely into our own minds, even within our own minds, 
the nature of the mind, what do you see? How much frustration we experience just because the mind continually changes. What you want today, you don't want tomorrow. What you like today, you don't like tomorrow. Maybe what you like this morning, you don't like this evening. The person you loved yesterday, you hate today. How often this happens and how much insecurity and how much fear and how much suffering that brings to us. So the Buddha encouraged us to look and see the world as it is according to reality. The world is all that is created and all that is created the Buddha called Sankata that which is compounded, that which is created. The physical world outside, our own bodies and the mental states including emotions, including thoughts, including feelings, including beliefs. All of this, he said, is in the realm of impermanence. It cannot be relied on. If you grasp at it, you will suffer. The Buddha compared it to a snake. A snake has a head and it has a tail. If you grab the head of it, then it will surely bite you and you may even die. But even if you grab the tail of it, still it will turn around and bite you and still you'll die. The head of the snake is that which is usually associated with goodness, with pleasant, I'm oh, sorry, the head of the snake is that which is associated with the unskillful, the unpleasant. The tail is associated with the skillful, the goodness. But still, it's all in the realm of sankata, condition, in the realm of duality. Grasping at it will bring suffering to us. So the Buddha encouraged us to see if we can go beyond, go towards the center. See if you can experience the peaceful mind. And this is why in meditation we encourage so much the practice of making the mind peaceful. There is no need to get back into the area of conflict again. Which technique is the right technique? Which technique is the best technique? Should I practice vipassana? Should I practice samatha? Should I practice the small vehicle or should I jump into the big vehicle? You see what happens. You see what you've done. You've just done it all over again, just latching on to more of the same. And the result is more confusion, more conflict, more disagreement. You're still far, far from the point of stillness. You're still far from the point of peace. You're still this caught in the realm of duality, in the realm of creation, in the realm of birth and death. And that attachment only brings more suffering. And most of the Buddhist world is busy doing it. So I like to stress, rather than starting to argue about techniques, arguing about Buddhist philosophy, arguing about which of the schools of Buddhism is the superior or the inferior. All I want to do is encourage the sincere seeker to make the mind peaceful. Just learn to make the mind peaceful. So many things will be resolved. When the mind becomes still, when the mind becomes silent, when the mind is bright and clear with shining awareness, in this stillness and silence with awareness, so much can become obvious and apparent. So much of the foolishness that controlled us and obsessed us, obsessed us, begins to dissolve. Because when the mind becomes still, we begin to see what the Buddha actually taught. We begin to see and not just think about. 
because thinking about it just goes around and round in a circle. Just around and round, but never to that center of stillness, never to the center of peace. You may think about the Buddha's teachings for a whole lifetime, and still you're only going round and round. And you know what happens when you spin around and round. The faster you go, the more dizzy you become. So, let us put all of this aside. And with true humility, true sincerity, aim for the point of stillness. Aim for the point of silence. Make the mind peaceful. In that peaceful mind, what the Dhamma actually is, manifests. We've heard the, the teaching of the Buddha, we've thought about the teaching of the Buddha, but we need to realize it. We've heard that Sabde Sankara Anicca, all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. We've heard it. We know it, we even believe it. So why do we still attach? So why do we still argue and fight? So why do we still continue to create so much suffering for ourselves and others? We've heard that sabbe, sankara, dukkha, all conditioned phenomena is unsatisfactory and it can never satisfy us. We've heard it, we've thought it, we even believe it. But why do we continually live with the goal, the sole goal of grasping more and more of Sankara in the hope of gratification, in the hope of true satisfaction, fulfillment and peace? This would indicate that what we've heard and what we know hasn't scratched the surface, or if it's, maybe it has scratched the surface, but it hasn't gone very deep. It's still up in the head, and it hasn't changed our emotional way of relating to life. It hasn't changed our basic approach to life. It hasn't changed our basic attachment to Sankara. And that is why it's not enough. If it was enough, then we should all be perfectly peaceful. We should have no problems. But it's not enough because we still have the same problem. What one knows, one cannot live. And that is why one must practice. One must practice to make the teaching a reality. What one must practice to make this teaching a living experience. My teacher used to say that when we come across Buddhism, first we hear the teaching, we listen to it. Then we start thinking about it. Then once we've thought about it, we start talking about it, maybe even teach it. But maybe only after that, and only some people, start actually practicing it. And only practice after practicing it, does one begin to see it. But even then, one still can't live it. And it's only a very long time of seeing the Dhamma, appreciating it deeply, that one actually becomes Dhamma. What one knows, one can live. This is the goal. So we study and we hear, but somehow we must be able to integrate it into our being, so that it radically changes the way that we live, the way that we see, the way that we think, the way that we relate to life. A radical change, a radical transformation of our way of being is the goal. The Buddha simply taught the path, the way to do this. Now, coming to the center, coming to peace, means that we begin to be, the mind begins to be fixed 
or able to see Dhamma. First we've heard it, now we've got to see it, to see Dhamma. The noisy mind, the thinking mind is not seeing Dhamma, that is thinking about Dhamma. It is when the mind becomes still and silent that the mind can begin to see things as they are. This stillness and silence of mind the Buddha called Samadhi. And we don't need to argue about what type of Samadhi and how much Samadhi. Just make the mind peaceful and quiet. In that silence it is possible to see. So now, how are you going to do it? How are you going to make your mind peaceful and quiet? Whatever means that you are familiar with, use it. Whatever you do, it's only a matter of technique. It's only a matter of skillful means. The important thing is to make the mind peaceful. The important thing is to learn to calm and quieten the mind. That noisy mind that is forever spinning, forever creating, forever in the realm of duality, has to somehow be brought to a quiet place of stillness. One of the very good techniques that the Buddha taught was Anapanasati mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of the inhalations and the exhalations. It is not the only Buddhist technique. It may not even be the, the best Buddhist technique. I don't think there is such a thing as the best Buddhist technique. If there was, the Buddha would have just taught that one and that was it. Why would he bother teaching inferior ones if there was the best? Obviously there is no such thing as the best technique of meditation. There are just various approaches, various techniques. Anapanasati is a very good one. It's a very neutral one. It's one that most people can use. It's very tranquilizing and calming. And it's not a mental activity. It's not a mental creation. You don't have to do anything at all when you practice anapanasati. All you have to do is stop and rest. Anapanasati. Mindfulness of the inhalation and the exhalation. From the day you were born, you breathe. Right through till the day you die. You were breathing this morning and you're still breathing tonight. Of course, whether you're mindful or not is a different thing. But the breath flows in and flows out according to the body's needs. There's no self in it. The body just breathes according to the conditions. When the body is working, running, it breathes rapidly, deeply. Even if you're sitting still and the mind is very agitated, then also the body will breathe rapidly. When the body is still and the mind is becoming quiet, the body breathes rhythmically, peacefully, long breath, subtle breath. The nature of the body conditions the nature of the breath. The nature of the mind also conditions the nature of the breath. The nature of the breath can condition the state of the body. The, state, the nature of the breath can also condition the state of the mind. When we understand this, we'll know how to use this anapana sati as a way of tranquilizing and calming the body, tranquilizing and calming the mind. Now, what I recommend but it doesn't have to be done this way. You can do it anyway. That works for you. What I recommend is that you sit quietly, sit very still, not in a sloppy posture, hold your body up, and also not too tense and rigid. 
so that you're reasonably relaxed, but you're holding yourself up. And then just allow the body to breathe, peacefully breathing in, peacefully breathing out. Just allow the body to breathe. No need to concentrate on the breath. No need to concentrate on a point of, on the breath. But just allow the mind to be with the body breathing. Allow the mind to breathe. Allow the mind to sink into the breath. And just breathe in and breathe out experiencing the breath flowing in, experiencing the breath flowing out. When breathing in, one knows that one is breathing in. When breathing out, one knows that one is breathing out. And one remains vigilant. The mind doesn't need to think about the breath. You don't have to create anything. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to imagine anything. You don't have to achieve anything. Just be. And be with the breath, flowing in, flowing out. Taking time off, resting, from all that normally preoccupies the mind, all that makes the mind busy, top-heavy, as you do this exercise, you will experience the mind sinking, sinking into the body. Because when we are top heavy, it means that the mind is so busy thinking, we actually begin to feel a pressure in the head, a pressure around the brain, with so much electric static energy shooting across the brain cells, or whatever happens when you think, that makes the head top heavy, the feeling is that the head is very heavy. As you allow the mind to shift out of that and just sink into this experience of the breath, flowing in and flowing out. This is not a thought of the breath, just the breath. The feeling, sensation, experience. The breath is always now. You can never concentrate on yesterday's breath. The breath is always just now. The breath is always in the immediate present. The breath is not interesting, not fascinating, but it's not unpleasant. The breath is just very neutral. The breath is very tranquil. The rhythmic motion of the breath is very tranquilizing. If we do this exercise with patience, with sincerity, the mind will gradually sink. The mind will become quiet. All of that imagery and all of that dialogue that normally clutters the mind subsides. And we begin to experience what it is to have a quiet mind what it is to have a peaceful mind. That is already a very wonderful thing to experience. But there is more. Because when we can appreciate the quiet mind, then we know what noise is. When we can appreciate the stillness of the mind, then we know what movement is. When we can appreciate the emptiness of mind, then we will know what creation is. And then we will understand what impermanence is. We will understand what unsatisfactoriness is. And if we are very careful and very attentive, we can also understand what non-self is. And if we can understand this, then conflict comes to an end. Then we can transcend suffering. Because never again will we grasp and latch on to. Never again will we invest in that which is impermanent, unsatisfactory, non-self. So how can we come to this as a living experience? First make the mind peaceful, 
then use that peaceful mind, that quiet mind, to reflect. We hear so much about vipassana meditation, and there are so many different ideas about vipassana meditation. Some of the ideas are quite silly. If you're concentrating on the rising and the falling of the abdomen, then you are doing vipassana. But if you're concentrating on the tip of the nose, then you're only doing samatha. That is one of the silly ideas, I think. But there are many such ideas. What constitutes vipassana? What constitutes samatha? The Buddha very rarely spoke in terms of samatha and vipassana. More often than not, for the greater occasions, he spoke simply of jitta bhavana, cultivating the mind. Jitta bhavana in Buddhism means to develop right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Not a technique. It's developing these qualities that constitutes jitta bhavana. Vipassana is the fruit or the result that arises from having cultivated right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. You cannot practice jitta, uh, you cannot practice vipassana. You do not practice vipassana. Vipassana arises as a result of developing mindfulness and concentration. What you practice is developing mindfulness and concentration. As we develop mindfulness and con concentration, insight or vipassana, seeing into truth is possible. Insight, seeing into is possible. So the various techniques that are called vipassana meditation are a little it's a misnomer or incorrectly named. Rather they should be named techniques or means by which vipassana may result. And all of these techniques are very similar in that they emphasize the development and the application of mindfulness. When the mind is peaceful, then the mind is also bright. The silent mind is not a blank. It's not like falling asleep. That's not what we mean by the silent, peaceful mind. That is called the dull and sleepy mind. That is not a meditative state. It's not that every night we crash out and go into this deep meditation state. That's a joke when people say that, and I'm going to do some laying down meditation now. Enter into an absorption state of meditation by going to sleep. That's not the peace, that is the, that may be a tranquil state, but it's not a, not the peaceful mind that we're talking about. The peaceful mind that we've been talking about in meditation, that we endeavor to develop, say, through the exercise of Anapanasati, is the mind that has become still and quiet, but at the same time is bright and awake. Bright and awake. The quality of knowing stands forth, clear. Now, when we practicing Anapanasati, we develop this by using the breath. But whatever you use, it must come to this. Silent and still, where the bright knowing stands forth. This bright knowing we can call sati, mindfulness, awareness. Clear knowing, bare awareness. It is this quality of mind when developed, sustained and applied, which results in insight, seeing clearly, seeing into 
things as they are. So as we have developed this now, the peaceful mind, the clear mind, it is possible for us to reflect. I'd like to use this word reflect because it has a, a very good meaning. A mirror reflects. When there's nothing in front of the mirror, the mirror is blank, just bright. When something passes or arises in front of the mirror, it is reflected. It stands forth in the mirror. It is seen in the mirror. The mind that is still and silent and brightly aware is like a reflective mirror. When there's nothing there, it's just empty and knowing. As soon as something arises, it is reflected. To reflect means to use this bright mind to notice, to see clearly the nature of the contents of consciousness the nature of the experience in consciousness, the nature of all that is created. This quiet, silent, peaceful mind that is clear and knowing is directed to look and see, not think about. We're not talking about thinking about. We're talking about just looking and seeing. That which arises in the mind is the creation, be it a thought, be it a mood, be it a feeling, a sense impression, pleasant or unpleasant, noble or coarse, it all has the same nature that we have already mentioned, anicca. But now, with this reflective mind, it is possible to see this. We can see what thought is. This phenomena which has enthralled humanity for so many thousands of years now. This phenomena that has brought man so many wonderful things, and women as well. And this phenomena which has also cursed mankind for all this time. Because it is through thought that we've developed such wonderful things that we call part of civilization. It is through thought that we can communicate, that we can conceive. But it's also through thought that we've developed all these attachments to views and opinions, to beliefs, that create all the suffering for mankind in the form of wars and conflicts. So, we can reflect and notice the nature of thought. You've heard it said that I think therefore I am. Or I am because I think. I don't know which one comes first. I think. So there is thought. That would be more accurate. There is thinking. I can see the thinking coming into the mind and I can see thinking passing. Thought arises and thought ceases. Good thoughts come into the mind and they pass away. Bad thoughts come into the mind and they pass away. But I see this. The reflective mind can reflect thought, can see thought, with attention we can also see where thought comes from, what stimulates thoughts, and where thoughts end. Thoughts come out of stillness and silence, and when they cease, there again is stillness and silence. If we can see this much, our attachment to views and opinions and beliefs is already greatly weakened. To go to war and kill because of a view and an opinion is the most foolish thing. To go to war because of a belief is even more foolish. What is a belief that humanity is killed 
each other for so long. I remember a belief. I believe. It sounds very impressive. So what? What is this belief? What is it? If one has developed the reflective mind, one can see that belief is nothing very permanent. Nothing very grand. People can believe anything, and they do believe anything. Anyone here can just set oneself up as a teacher, and I'm, I guarantee that you will have disciples. It doesn't matter what you teach, you will have disciples. Guarantee success. You just go out there and you start teaching it. And somebody's going to believe you, that's all there is to it. <laughs> doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, useful or useless. You do it. It's just a matter of whether a lot or a few will believe you, but surely there'll be people who believe you. People will believe. That's just like falling in love, isn't it? Just like liking. I like ice cream. So what? <laughs> well, it's very similar to I believe in something. I believe in God. So what? I don't believe in God. So what? It's just a belief, isn't it? It's just a concept, something created in the mind, a bias, a preference, a perception, a way of seeing, and a bias towards that way of seeing. It's impermanent, because what you believe, you can also disbelieve, and this happens very often. First you believe, then later on you don't believe. Just like love. First you love, and then you don't love anymore. First you like, and then you don't like anymore. And this belief, this liking, this view, this bias, this preference, is just a conditioned state of mind. There is no thing intrinsically absolute about it. It is just a conditioned state of mind. You are conditioned to believe. You are conditioned to have certain views. You are conditioned to think in a particular way and to perceive in a particular way. We are all brainwashed. Not by some evil force, not by some government institute or by some religious maniac, but just by the way life is. Our beliefs, our likes, our preferences, our way of thinking, our ideas, are conditioned. That's, it. That's just the way it is. All of these things are conditioned. So, what, for instance, do you consider to be beautiful? And how do you know it is beautiful? Why is it beautiful? And why are there so many different views about what is beautiful? Where their idea of female beauty was very different than most people's idea these days. One of them had this uh, tradition that the ladies had to insert these, I think they were either coins or shells, under their bottom lip, so as to expand their lip and make it into a little plate like it sticks out, and like a little plate, I guess you can put your food on <laughs> And the bigger this lid beca became, the more beautiful the lady, more, probably even more closer to home to most of you because you're learning Chinese, one of the old Chinese torches for ladies, <laughs> to bind their feet so they would have pretty little I guess the smaller the feet, the more beautiful the lady. 
You may think that's really old and archaic. We're more enlightened these days, but no, we're still very much conditioned. It's just our standards of judgment have changed, that's all. And quite a, a lot of the things we do that to enhance is beauty is quite ridiculous really. If you if you could see it from a different perspective, you would see how utterly I mean it's a joke sometimes. <laughs> But still, that's the, our conditioning, and it's valid. I mean, it has, it has its reality. But all I'm pointing to, I don't want to... It's not a, a judgment on what is beautiful or not beautiful. I'm just pointing to how we arrive at this judgment, at this bias, or this perception. It is purely conditioned. It is conditioned by our society, by what is acceptable, what is fashionable, what the majority say, where we're brought up, and what we've been told, and on and on it goes, and so we decide, and we think, that is beautiful. That is, our perception of beauty is very impermanent, and it is conditioned, and very relative, and it changes. In my monastery that I lived one year, they had all these dogs, so many dogs. Terrible. Because dogs can, they're all right sometimes of the year, other parts of the year they can be really noisy. Dogs can, they're all right sometimes of the year, other parts of the year they can be really noisy. And there was uh, this one particular dog that I at first developed a great aversion for. I know monks are not supposed to have a version, but we can't stop these things sometimes. After the meal, we took our bowls, because we eat out of our arms bowls. So after the meal, we take the bowl out to wash it. And before washing, we put the bowl down and we take our robes off, our upper robes, so as to wash the bowls. And even though one should try and only take the amount of food that one is going to eat, more often than not, there's some scraps of food or some food left over in the bowl that you don't finish. So one day I went out, put my bowl down, went off, had to remove my robe and hang it up, and I looked around and there was this dog with his head in my bowl, <laughs> eating the food out of my bowl. And we, you know, we're taught from the first time when you ordain, you're taught that you must look after this bowl as if it's the head of the Buddha. So you become very, very protective of the bowl. So there's this dog with his head in my bowl. And I got quite upset and I shouted and chased it. And immediately I had this negative feeling towards this dog, dog. And then when I looked at it, it had this droopy lip. His lower lip was hanging down. I thought, what an ugly dog. <laughs> That's my judgment, you see, immediately. What an ugly dog. And I didn't like it. But then this dog kept on coming, day after day. Because he was one of the weaker dogs. And so he's scrounging around, always trying to get something to eat. So even my hard, cruel, cold heart began to soften. And I started to feed this dog because he'd he, he come around all the time. So I started to feed. I'd keep a little bit of food and give it to this dog. And slowly, affection started to arise. I started to like this dog. From disliking it, it changed to liking it. And instead of thinking it was an ugly dog, the more I looked at it, I thought it was cute. <laughs> because this droopy look exposed its teeth and it made it look as if it was smiling. <laughs> so I called it Smiley. And this dog would come every day to get some food. And I developed a great... I mean, it was quite interesting to see because at first there was aversion, dislike, and contempt. And the perception was, what an ugly dog. And then, just in a matter of uh, a few days or a week or two, the perception changed. And I thought, what a nice, friendly dog. What a cute dog. <laughs> My favorite dog. And that's very interesting, isn't it? How our perception can change so drastically. But what we perceive is conditioned. And because it's conditioned, it's impermanent. It changes. So what we see as beautiful, what we see as uh, 
sentence, what we see as reasonable. Why can't you see it in a reasonable way? Because the way, my way of seeing it reasonably is different to your way of seeing it reasonably. Be reasonable, as if there is one standard way of being reasonable. Assuming that everybody must see it this way. That's reasonable. Can't you see it? No, because I see it differently. Because my conditioning is different. Because my perceptions are conditioned, and they are different than yours. And this also applies in the realm of belief. A Christian isn't born a Christian. They may say you're born a Christian. No one's born a Christian. No one's born a Muslim. No one's born a Buddhist. You're made one. You may, you're made by the external influence or also by your own, your own conditioning because you condition your mind as well. So you can work on it the way you condition the mind. But these are not, there's nothing intrinsic about a human being that makes one a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian. Nothing at all. It's conditioning. To see the world in the, in the, through the Christian concepts. You know, every Christian will take it for granted. That, well, of course God exists. What do you mean? <laughs> And we say to them, we believe in reincarnation, or we believe in rebirth. You crazy or something? That's ridiculous. But why is it ridiculous? Simply because this person is being conditioned never to think like that, but to think in a very different way. That there is birth, then you die, and you go to hell, or you go to heaven, and that's it. Finish. And if they're taught that from the beginning, right through, and never heard anything else, when they hear something else, well, that's ridiculous. It's like people you know, told the earth is flat. Well, it seems reasonably, and our senses more or less could you know, convince us of that. Yes, the earth is flat. I can walk without sliding down, you see. Well, it's flat. Yeah, it's all right. Somebody comes around and says, the earth is round. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> So now, our perceptions, which includes our beliefs, because beliefs are based on the way we perceive. Our loves, our likes, are based on the way we perceive. And our perceptions are conditioned. Therefore, our beliefs are conditioned. They're not absolute. Our likes, our preferences, is conditioned. The way we reason is conditioned. And when it is conditioned, it means that it's relative. That means it's one way for someone, different for someone else, and even within the one person, it changes. Now, I'm dwelling on this point on purpose, because so much of the conflict, so much of the trouble in life arises from not understanding, not seeing the relative nature of thought, of views, opinions, of beliefs, of likes and dislikes, of loves and hates. But if we have this silent mind and we can reflect, objectify and see the nature of these creations, how relative they are, the attachment, the clinging, the grasping immediately loosens. That hold begins to loosen. With the loosening of the attachment there comes a releasing of the suffering, a relieving of the areas of conflict. It's very important. If one understands this truly, one would not go out to fight for my belief. Maybe we could sit down and discuss our beliefs and agree to have different beliefs. But now there is also another very important point here, one that I've already just touched on briefly, when I said that not only are our perceptions conditioned by the external world, conditioned by others, conditioned by society, but that we ourselves can also condition our perceptions. 
perception, if you wish, in Pali, the word is sanya. Sanya can mean something like recognizing, but it's more like the way we see something. The way we see it, the way that's what recognizing it, the way we see it. Now this is conditioned, and we can affect it. We can have some way of changing it as well, because it is conditioned. And we can change it. Now this is very important, because this opens a whole new scope for us, a whole new area of mental cultivation. We can change our personality. We can change the way we see the world, the way we see others. In particular, we can change it from the negative to the positive. Why? Because to see things in a positive light is more peaceful, more happy, less room for conflict. And this is the practice of metta bhavana. This is where we intentionally, with a calm and concentrated mind, bring a new perception of positive kindness towards ourselves and towards others. It's like a reconditioning. But I mention this just by the way to make it clear that it's not only that we are conditioned by others and by things around us, but we also condition our own mind, the state of the mind, the quality of the mind. And this is an important area of cultivating the mind. It's like changing, changing the creations, changing the conditioning of the mind, so as to have a happier mind, a more wholesome mind. Now, as we continue in this mental cultivation, this view or the seeing of things as they are becomes more and more perfect. So that we see clearly all that is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. In other words, we really see this as insight. You heard of the first sermon delivered by the Buddha, the Dhamma Jaka Pavatana Sutta. The Buddha has just been enlightened. And he taught this discourse, this two months after his enlightenment, he taught this discourse to the five ascetics who had been living with him prior to his enlightenment. It is the essence, one can say, of the Buddha's teaching. And at the end of this discourse, Kondanya, who was one of the disciples there, had this vision of Dhamma. Whatever is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. This is the mind, calm, clear, alert, penetrated, sees with insight the impermanent nature of creation. With that seeing with insight, there's the release. And Kondanya became Anya Kondanya. Kondanya who knows. Kondanya who sees. And that was Kondanya's enlightenment as a Sodapana. So if we can do this much in this lifetime, it'll be wonderful. It's already a long way. And I think I have already gone on long enough too. So this is not by any means a complete comprehensive explanation of Buddhism or meditation. I simply want to point out these few aspects which I, after having been in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur and then in Malaysia, I was in Malacca as well, having been in Malaysia for four or five, six days, so I feel there is a, a need to clarify some of these points in the hope that it will be a basis for more progress on the path rather than progress towards conflict. <laughs> So I offer these thoughts to you this evening. I hope it's of some value to you. And uh, now I would like to invite you to ask questions either in regards to what I have said or maybe in regards to what you uh, wanted me to talk about and I didn't talk about. Thank you very much. Ah, ah, ah. Wow.
Well, let the thoughts come. No, if you are mindful, you see, this is mindfulness. So the thoughts will come into the mind, you must expect that. Don't think of concentrating the mind in terms of just like going into the room and shutting the doors, if you'll be able to do that with your mind. You sit down and shut the door, nothing comes in. And you can't do it, unless you're really, well, I'm not sure, either some sort of psychotic or some sort of very skilled meditator, one of the two. I mean, you may be a very skilled meditator, but people sometimes who do that actually are a bit crazy. They go a bit crazy because there's so much cause. In this practice that I was encouraging was just a preliminary calm in the mind. So there will be thoughts, that's all right. Thoughts coming to the mind. But that's not the bread. So we come back to the bread. We're supposed to be with the bread. Our intention is to be with the bread. Our intention is to rest with the bread. Thoughts come. As soon as we know it, we come back to the bread. Thoughts come again. We come back to the bread. It's just the intention to rest with the bread. It's not the intention to shut out thoughts. Don't set that up. Because that will only lead to conflict again. It's a, it's a tension. I'm not going to think. So then, how can you relax with the bread? If you're not going to think. Bridge your teeth. And you can do that as an exercise, but then that's not anapanasati. Anapanasati simply means your intention is to be with the bread. You're allowing the mind to sink and relax with the breath. And you don't have to do any special breathing. Just breathe in, the body breathing in, let the mind breathe in with the body. Let the body breathe out, the mind breathes out. Just breathing in, just breathing out. Peacefully breathing in, peacefully breathing out. At first there will be a bit, and then the mind is kind of at first, resisting. It wants to pull away, it wants to go away, but you just let it, encourage it, encourage it. Don't force it, just encourage it. Encourage it like, it's like you have a horse, and you want to make this horse cross the river, and the horse doesn't want to cross the river, it's afraid of the water. Now if you start pushing that horse and pulling it, it's not going to go with you. <laughs> And it's stronger than you as well. But if you can just reassure it, just encourage it, soothe it, encourage it. Come on, it's all right. It's, it's very nice and cool. It's very nice on the other side. Nice grass to eat. Come on. <laughs> just encourage the mind. It's just, for a start, really can appreciate how good it is to rest, how good it is to be peaceful how good it is for the mind to just come to stillness and silence. And then encourage the mind. Peacefully breathing. Gently breathing in. Gently breathing out. Just breathing in. Just breathing out. I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. This is just soothing the mind and encouraging the mind to come out of its thinking. Of course, then, the habit will be that you'll start thinking about something. But then that's not the breath. So as soon as you know it, you say, oh, the breath. Just breathing in. Just breathing out. Allow the mind to quieten and come to rest with the breath flowing in and flowing out. Vigilant, gentle effort. This is the first step. It's just calming the mind. Once the mind is calm, we can also concentrate. If the mind is not calm, it's not possible to concentrate. So the first step is calming the mind, calming the body. When you're breathing in peacefully, it's soothing to the body. And it also works on calming the mind. Thoughts are just natural. They will, but they will come to the mind. The problem is that we then just get caught in the thinking. One thought comes into the mind and we think for the next half hour. Well, so that's the problem, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with the thought that comes into the mind, but it's then because we don't have mindfulness and we think for the next half hour, heedlessly one thought after another after another, 
Well, that's, that's the problem. But if the thought comes into the mind, then we say, oh, no, that's not the breath, and I just come back to the breath. There's no problem. Just like sounds. When you have ears, you're going to hear. What are you going to do? Stuff something in your ear? And the sounds come to the ear, you hear. So what? That's not the breath. You just come back to the breath. Please be breathing in, please be breathing out. You have ears, you're here. Just leave it at that. Instead of, oh, there's noise. How can I possibly meditate with all this noise? Why can't I shut up? <laughs> but it, it requires a lot of mm, say patient effort, mm, gentle effort, and just repetition. Any other question? Well, there are various things that you can do, and they're all fine. Even if you just, you see, refine that. Just refine the amount of peace, the amount of concentration then. Once the mind is calm, breathing in peacefully and out peacefully, and you experience that, then you can actually concentrate the mind. You can develop deeper concentration, which is a very good thing to do, because that is a way of uh, strengthening the mind further. So usually you encourage people to then focus the attention on one point and just learn to collect all of the mind, collect of all the attention on that point, to collect the mind, collect the mind, collect the mind, so that the mind completely withdraws and goes to the, collects on that one object. So this is a very important part of the practice. And we call this developing mm, concentration, or developing samadhi. And samadhi is, uh, is necessary, because that's what gives the mind its stability, and its strength, penetrating strength. It's what gives mindfulness its consistency as well. Mm. So that uh, if we can develop samadhi, then mindfulness is also greatly enhanced. And we develop samadhi by having mindfulness, so they help each other in this way. So that's one thing, the next step that I usually encourage people. Um, also, I, besides that, so even that, just if I may say also that, that is already quite enough actually, just to do that, because through concentration, insight can arise. Just whether you want it or not, through concentration, insight does arise spontaneously. You don't have to create it. <laughs> it can and does arise. However, because many people uh, have difficulty in developing this sort of concentration to such a depth, so as a an alternative approach, and it's also a supportive approach. I usually encourage people that once the mind is calm, in addition to endeavoring to concentrate the mind, at times they also use whatever calmness and clarity they have in order to reflect. Which simply means in order to use this wakeful, clear state of mind to notice to really notice. What you notice is the nature of that which comes into the consciousness. What that which arises in your mind. This is what I was trying to explain. What arises in your mind has the characteristics of impermanent, unsatisfactory, not self. So we use this wakeful, clear mind to really notice to intentionally be directed to notice impermanence. Thoughts arise, we are there. Thoughts cease, we also see the cessation. We notice, we, we direct the mind to see impermanence, the impermanent nature of that which arises in the mind. So this is using the clarity and the peacefulness of mind to notice impermanence. And this I call reflection, or reflecting. Rather than say, the concentration is when the primary objective is simply to collect the mind, collect the mind more deeply, more deeply. 
I also encourage people to use the mind in order to, again, notice as clearly as possible anatta, non-self. These are the two main characteristics that I encourage people to work on. Personally, I very much like anatta, non-self. With this peaceful mind, then one can begin to understand anatta. Not thinking about it though. The peaceful mind, the quiet mind. When I mean quiet, it doesn't mean that your mind doesn't hear sounds outside. It's not that degree of concentration. It's not necessary. It's just the mind is, you, there is space, there is silence in the mind. And the way I encourage people to do this uh, reflection is to, for a start, you must have this sincere, dare I say, desire. People always start to tremble when they say desire. And immediately they feel there's uh, some, some inconsistency in the teaching of the Buddha. <laughs> but we're only using words, so you, know, you can say aspiration, wish. But it's that movement of the mind, that sincere wish to know. Sincere wish, sincere need to know who you are. And with a peaceful mind, we look. We probe, we think, we seek for this me. And it is through this, uh, this way of reflecting that we begin to develop a true appreciation of anatta, non-self. Now this is a particular technique that I like to use. Um, it's, I mean, a, I, to explain it, it probably take a bit of time. I don't know whether I should continue along that, but it's just one way of using the peaceful mind in order to, I don't call it insight meditation, all it is is using the peaceful mind, mindfulness and concentration, in order to notice, 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 until insight can arise. So all we're doing is developing mindfulness and concentration and applying it, applying it to see, to see, to see. And what we endeavor to see, what we see through noticing, noticing is anicca dukkha anatta. And that is commonly referred to as vipassana meditation. In other words, meditation which aims at the arising of insight. Using this mindfulness, you know, but is present in the peaceful mind to notice, intentionally notice. I mean, that's the primary objective, to notice. Not the other way is make the primary objective to concentrate, to concentrate the mind, to concentrate the mind. Mm -hmm. It's just a shift in emphasis. They are not two separate things. They are not. Either you do samatha or you do vipassana. There's samatha, there's vipassana. Mm -hmm. Two separate things, two separate people. It's not like that at all. Samatha and Vipassana, we compare as two, the two ends of one stick. They're associated together, they're attached together, or connected. It's just that sometimes you pick up one end of the stick, another time you pick up the other end of the stick, but whichever end you pick up, the other end comes with it. So that you always get both ends, you can only have one end. You will never be able to get Vipassana without Samatha. Nor can you really do just Samatha, because to attain concentration, you must apply mindfulness. Samadhi results from sati. When there is mindfulness, then you will see. You can't help. You do see. Mindfulness has that function, it's to see. But it is just a shift in emphasis. When we emphasize developing more samadhi, then our primary concern is to collect, 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 collect the mind, focus the mind, withdraw the mind, absorb the mind. That's our primary function. In doing that, we will see many things as well. When we emphasize more reflection, well, it's more like using the mindfulness, notice, to notice, to notice, notice that the characteristic of impermanence and non-self in particular. 
And uh, uh, in, uh, the characteristic of non-self is a very is a very powerful one because it's the most uh, intriguing, challenging, fascinating uh, teaching of the Buddha, unique. Any other question? Well, at the very start, I usually recommend, like the first time or something, I, I recommend something like 15 minutes and maybe then 20 minutes and half an hour. And when you can do half an hour comfortably, then maybe try 40 minutes. It also depends on uh, what your lifestyle will allow, not only what your body and mind will allow, but what your lifestyle will allow. In other words, your responsibilities, duties, your schedule, it may restrict you in how much time you can give to meditation. So I would recommend beginning with a small period and gradually building it up. And it's very good if one can build it up to one hour. It's very good. And to do it maybe, um, I would recommend if one can do it twice a day, it's good. Even if it's only half an hour each time, it's better to do it twice a day rather than once a day. But that depends on you, and that's not very much. That's more like, and that will help, that, that will help our lives. Don't expect some fantastic results from that. It, well, you may get fantastic results because everybody's different, but generally, ordinary people, or, or most of us, it's half an hour of meditation, its function, its function is to calm and clear the mind, to give us a little bit of clarity and a bit of grounding. And uh, also very supportive, of course, is how we live the rest of the day, what we do and how we do it. If we can choose how we do the rest of the day, and so that we live in a constructive, skillful way, and also live it mindfully, then of course it, meditation can uh, be something which is uh, quite powerful in our lives, because it becomes part of our whole life, rather than just the little part. And if one has been meditating for, you know, for some time, doing a regular daily practice, then it's very beneficial to do a retreat sometime, and on some occasion, like a weekend retreat, which is devoted purely to meditation. And these are very good uh, opportunities for um, building up momentum, you know, to sort of because you, when you practice regularly, then you, you've got a certain amount of momentum, but it, it doesn't gain, it doesn't get very far. But if you give it a boost and do a weekend of intense meditation, then it gets uh, quite a boost very quickly. Of course, you can't maintain that, you can't sustain it, but it's always, it, you know what, what is possible. So you will always have a direction, you will know what can be done. And that's very helpful for us in our meditation. But, uh, weekend retreats or ten-day retreats are very popular. Uh, however, I don't know what happens at this stage, whether you have cups of tea or finish with the service or... And, uh, however, after the after you finish, I won't rush off, so if people I will be available if people want to ask for questions and maybe a bit shy to ask in front of everyone. Um, so I will stay for a little bit longer if people do have questions. Yatha vari vaha pura pari purenti sagaram meva meva ito tinnam te tanam upakapati Ichitam patitam tum hanki pamme vasami chato sabbe purento sankapam Chanto panaraso yatta manichoti raso yatta sabbe tiyo vivajanto 
ความบรมโควินาสัตุมาเทบวานวันตารายโยสุขิติกายโกบวานอภิวาดานาสิเนสานิจังวุตาปัจจายโนชัตตาโรดัมมาวัตันติอายุวันโนสุขังบลังบวันตุสัพบมังกลังรักันตุสัพบเดวตามสัพบดุดานุบาเวนาสัพบธรรมานุบาเวนาสัพบสังฆานุบาเวนาสัตสัตติบวันตุเตมอวิชิโอลอายุวันนัสุขะพลา